everybody enjoyed oh, lunch. Yeah. Feel free to very come Huge. up on and sit closer if you want, since we have a, a small group. Um, this panel is really going to just cover a lot of different topics. Um, I've got some questions here uh, as moderator to, to ask our panelists. Um, but if you have a question that you, or a topic that you want to talk about, please raise your hand. Someone um, like Joe or Megan in the room will, will run over with a mic so that you can um, address the question that you have. Our panelists can can give their responses. Um, with me, I've got Betty Chan. Betty's a senior PM at Purpose PBC in New York City. You also have offices in London, right? Yeah, we have an office in, of learning that's Cluckenwell. Okay. Yeah. Uh, First Sam, time in London, sorry guys. <laughs> uh, Sam Barnes, also senior development manager at m and Digital. And Natalie Semchuk is a consulting digital PM from now Phoenix, Arizona yes. in the States. Um, so thank you all for joining me. Um, we've had a little bit of um, sort of pre-panel discussion and prep with some questions, so I'm going to kick it off. But like I said, if you have any, a question, please feel free to raise your hand and, and we'll, we'll kick it off. So kind of uh, general topics about project management. Let's kick it off with an easy one. Um, what is your favorite thing about being a digital <laughs> project manager? You want to start, Betty? Well, I looked at the question list and I'm like, do you guys have to be so existential about all this? <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, I'm sure there's a variety of answers around it, but the first thing that comes to mind from a, a conversation we were having last night was probably, and it sounds weird, but being in control and having an impact, which for me for years when I started doing PM, the hard part was figuring out like where our value was coming from. We don't have physical deliverables to give, um, so you can't see our work so much. but I think through our ability to help and things like that, it, you start seeing results, which is my favorite part, probably. Yeah. Mine's kind of similar. It's the impact you can have on the people around you. Mm -hmm. But I think, so when I started out as a developer, it was I could do a job. And it was if I did the job well, mm -hmm. great. But it, was, it didn't feel like it would go further than someone who could appreciate code. Or the client just go in, yeah, cheers. Thanks yeah. for that. Great. But as a PM, I just found that you can, you can just have an impact on every single person. There's nothing nicer than when a client, a boss, the team will all go, oh, that was, that was easier than the last project with the other project yeah. manager. So you've got, you've got quite a lot of power, I think, is when that sounds a bit weird. But yeah. In a good way. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I agree with uh, both of you. I definitely like that kind of, not control, but assistance you can have in delivering something and the communication involved. Um, but additionally, I really like sort of the variety of things I'm exposed to. I'm not necessarily a specialist in you know, design or development. I get to be a part of all of these projects that might have all of these different goals or different deliverables. And I work with different teams, different clients, um, different managers, and all of these different people who I get to be sort of exposed to and, and understand a lot more what they do and bring that into my own practice, which I think is really valuable. Yeah, yeah I completely agree with that. I love the variety, especially if if you're working within an agency, I think like the variety of different types mm -hmm. of clients and experiencing different working environments. I think yeah. I always think back to um, when I was working at a, an agency, we worked with MTV. Mm -hmm. And when that contract was signed, I was like, 16 year old me is so happy right now. <laughs> <laughs> so excited. And then once I got to know MTV and, and the, the stakeholders, I was like, nope, <laughs> I never want to work with MTV. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I felt really lucky to actually have that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. right. But I also think with that brings challenges, right? Like mm -hmm. challenges of dealing with different types of people and organizations and things like that. Along those lines, like what are the things that are most challenging about being a, a PM? Uh, for me, it's, it, it's being pushed and pulled. It's the, it's the complete opposite of why it's good then the variety you get and the impact you have, it's when those things tend to, tend to fall down, especially mm -hmm. all at once. So just being pushed and pulled in every direction. Um, I think uh, when I started out being a PM, I wasn't I experienced and I, I kind of didn't mm -hmm. know how to handle that, I think. Um, so you had the, you know, the, the technical people were wanting to work in a certain way, and you had the client wanting it now, and your boss wanted everything. Uh, it was quite difficult to, to manage, but I think over the years, um, I think I've got a bit better at it, but I still I feel, I mean, I'm, I'm not actually a project manager right now, but I, when I see them, I empathize so much because I, you know, I, 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 until you do it, I think it's really hard to explain what it's actually like yeah. to have all those people chomping at you from every angle, basically. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I think it's hard too for me to measure personal success. So I know if a project is delivered um, on time or on budget or meets all of the goals that a client lays out, I know that that's successful, but it's hard for me to know with all of the factors that go into a project, um, sometimes how much my impact uh, made a difference and where I, like you were kind of saying before, um, you know, what little things I am doing or can improve. And it's not necessarily something we hear unless we specific, specifically ask for it or we're specifically doing it wrong, I think. Um, we don't tend to get that little positive feedback. Whereas, you know, a designer might hear, wow, I really like how this design flows. I really like these details. Um, you know, and when a website launches and it's new, it's very obvious that there's a lot of improvements you can measure performance and you can measure um, you know the amount of people going to it if you're doing marketing but it's harder with a project management I think to know specifically what parts of your job contributed which is I think part of the fun too like we don't have to be the big showrunners but it's nice to sort of know um, where you made a difference and it's harder to sort of figure that out at times yeah mm -hmm. it's that team effort dynamic like you can't yeah. identify where you come in right? yeah that makes sense um, for me planning my own life, I am reckless when it comes to <laughs> off hours. Like, if you go to my hotel room now, you'll probably see clothes everywhere because <laughs> I just don't have the ability to manage my own life sometimes. And I think I forget that. Like, I'm so into helping people prioritize their time. I've gotten really good with that and being their sounding board that I don't know how to be my own sounding board, or maybe that's not the way it works. Maybe I just need to find someone to be that person for me. So finding the balance and like applying my skills to my own life is probably the hardest challenge for me. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with that. I think, I think you make a good point. It's good to have a person that you can lean on. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a person who is in your organization. Mm -hmm. um, even better if you can find a community or people outside of your organization yes. to vent to. <laughs> Um, I know I've done that a lot with this guy over Same. here <laughs> and vice versa. And it's just been really helpful for just staying sane and knowing that like, is, am I off base with the way that I'm feeling about this situation or person? Yeah. So um, if you can find a mentor or just a confidant, I think that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, you bring up the I idea of kind of like managing teams and dealing with people also. Um, I think you know a big topic that I, Molly talked about earlier is um, sort of like managing distributed teams, and I know that you've got Natalie a lot of experience with that. Um, how would you say it differs from like managing projects with teams, you know, in a actually like in an office environment versus remote? Um, I think you lose a lot of the nuances you get in an office environment, and sometimes that's for the better, and sometimes it's for the worse, but um, like Molly was saying, you know, there's not as much, um, you know, body language or something like that. So you might tend to use more emojis, uh, which I'm a big fan of, but you sort of lose that like little um, interaction you have with teams, getting to know them. You don't necessarily have, um, unless you make an effort to do, have a small talk and to sort of interact with them more frequently, you don't naturally have that. You're not walking by someone's desk, um, which means that when it comes to the actual project and things are either difficult or you have a difficult request or someone isn't maybe performing in a way that's helping the project, it's much more difficult to address those things head on um, because you don't have that natural a relationship with someone. So you have to really intentionally build those relationships, intentionally think about how you communicate. Um, a lot of people have talked about, you know, communicating after hours and being really understanding of where people are at in their day. So when you're remote, you really need to think about that in terms of their location. Um, if you're working with people in different countries, you know, what their customs are and where their holidays might fall. And then being really patient and understanding that just because you need something and are asking it now, you're not entitled to an answer right away. You might not get it in the format that you're used to. You have to be very clear, you know, if something needs to be handled over video or voice, um, it's a lot more of an effort than just, you know, walking by someone's desk and having a casual con yeah. conversation. So it's a lot more deliberate and really makes you think about the little things a lot more. Any questions from anyone in the audience? <laughs> or did you have something to add? <laughs> I was just gonna, it reminded me of a, a story about how I learned uh, for myself about what it's like to be remote, I guess. So we worked for a company, we were all in one place, um, and then we had, we, we basically had a satellite office in London and one in Windsor. And we had about five or six people in the satellite office and then the headquarters was, was Windsor. And I had uh, one of my team, 
and they kind of had a reputation as, as they were solid, they were great, but when things, didn't, when things were sort of going a bit wrong, they kind of tended to flap um, and get a bit panicky. So that was the feedback I gave, gave this person, and that they weren't, it was actually that lady up there on my presentation, Chris, <laughs> um, and she, she actually, usually we got on great, and this one she really wasn't happy, with, like she didn't agree, but I just sort of st stood by what I said. Um, she said that when she's in London and something's going wrong, that on a project that she could well be a big part of, um, it was very difficult for her to know what was going on. She felt she, that's why she was flapping. She didn't know what was going on. I just thought, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> of course, two weeks later, I'm in the London office because I have to do it <laughs> once a week, and uh, something went wrong on the platform. It's quite a serious one. And within 10 minutes, I was like, okay, I get it, because I was I was senior trying to sort this out, but no, one, but everyone was, was dealing with it in Windsor, not informing us, because obviously the last thing you want to do when you're fighting fires is give a running commentary. Right. But actually, over the probably about a year, we got used to giving that running commentary just to let people know what was going on. Sometimes we'd had a, a, a FaceTime, permanent FaceTime, so they could just see the chaos. But right. it just helped because they could come back in. So it, I, I think without doing that, I wouldn't have believed. I think I was a bit too arrogant. So I think it really made me mindful of, of how much you have to involve people and be, like you say, be yeah. deliberate. It's not, it's not natural. You think it's fine because it's a slack, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just did, I didn't do it properly. It's almost like <laughs> over communicating. Yeah, yeah. is Basically. not a bad thing. In yeah, that although scenario. I just drop the over for when it's remote. It's just that's the way it needs to be, right? Right, yeah. right. Does anyone have a, a question in the audience? Yes, no. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think one of the things when you're working with remote teams is. Uh, it's so key. To, well, we're all we're all client facing. It's be yourself as well. Like um, I've worked. I, one of the most complicated projects I worked on I had a disbanded team, three locations in the UK, one in Mumbai, one in Romania, and Moldova as well. One two one developer in Moldova, one in um, uh, Romania, and testers in India. And it was you know it's hard. You got all these different cultures and. I found that the more I was myself, the yeah. easier it was for all of these people to sort of get on. And, and you didn't, you didn't really, you know, uh, as long as you're not offensive, you know. <laughs> I find that hard, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I, I, you know, to your point where, where you know you're sort of talking about you can't see the body language, you can't, you know, there, there's a lot that you lose. But being the people that we are, we're people, people, right? So mm -hmm. you know, you, you've you've got to be as as um, honest with everyone, I think, anyway. So it's really just to agree with that. Well, that makes me think of people that are doing sort of stand-ups in Slack now, which is for efficiency. Mm. But as a manager of people, that, like, that's a, good, a really great opportunity to see or pick up how someone's feeling, yeah. looking, speaking. You lose that in Slack. So it's got its benefits, but I think there's definitely a reason to stick to the people face-to-face. -face. Yeah. So let's, let's kind of switch gears for a minute. Uh, agile versus waterfall is always a, a PM topic. Um, I don't know if waterfall is, is such a, a thing anymore, though I know that there are people oh, still right. pretty much <laughs> practicing it, but I think looking to get away from it. Um, but how do you recommend um, someone kind of choose an approach to take when they're starting a new project? I don't have a thought. Um, I can take this one. So we work with what we call Agifall. You know, it's like whatever <laughs> it. we can do. So I do agree with Sam, like waterfalls still exist in some form or mm -hmm. another. Um, and I think it, it really depends on the project. So for me, the answer would be it's never a fixed starting method. Um, and usually it, it just tends to always start a bit more waterfall. In strategy, you do need to have a bit more linear conversations and build upon the ideas. Um, so that's why it tends to lean better on waterfall. But once it hits development QA, it turns really agile really quickly. Yeah. Um, so that's usually been my experience. But always just kind of, for me, I don't want to prescribe up front, but just suggest that like, hey, this is a framework we're going to try, but leave it really open-ended to say that we can modify this as we go. Mm -hmm. And we're not stuck with that framework the whole way through. Yeah. Um, I, f same approach, really. Um, the first thing is, like, don't just assume Agile is the way you have to go. I think, mm. it, like, w when this topic is ever talked about, I always find the context, the context is so important. So when Agile first became a thing, it was like, we must do this thing, it's great. But what, if you, what I've noticed about the, 
the articles or the companies posting stuff was that they were either very, very small and, and just starting up, sort of having learned all the lessons of why it's a good thing to start that way, but also starting Greenfield is much easier to make it happen. But also, the key thing for me was the difference between building a product or software development versus websites or something for a client that is a one-off or, or it, just does, it just doesn't, it doesn't marry itself well to work in that agile way. Um, so really just, just talk to the client. Don't, don't force Agile, I think, is the honest thing. And just make sure that you're focusing on the, the, what will give the best result rather than how your agency works. Yeah. I've worked with clients who say that they are Agile. <laughs> um, yeah, and then you know, like the, the agency has to fit within that model in order to work well with them. Um, and I found that the the best thing that we could do in that scenario was say, well, what does, what does Agile mean to you? Mm -hmm. um, because I think what we've probably all found and know is that not everyone is actually running it the same way or the way. Um, so even if you've been to a, a training, um, which I think, have, have you all been trained in Agile? No? I haven't, no. I, I have, I think you I'm have. I'm certified product owner, because yeah. I did two days, of course. That's right. it, I'm certified, I'm <laughs> expert. That's the shoulder. <laughs> I would you be a terrible product owner. You took a <laughs> test to get a, uh, a certificate. No, no test for that one, just, just, oh. just turned up. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the thing is, it's very easy to teach a specific way of working, right? It's less easy to put those mm -hmm. methods into practice on all projects, like mm -hmm. there is no, one size fits all. It's sort of like the question of like, what tool do you use? It's mm -hmm. like, well, what works for you? Yeah. What are you trying to accomplish? Right. Like it's not a one, it's like you said, not one size fits all. A tool isn't gonna fix everything. A methodology isn't gonna fix everything. Yeah. I think I had a consultant once and I was agile consultant. It was actually really good. And I, one statement he said about people that are so fixed on their way of working, he said, beware the scrum, scrum the mentalist. Uh, and that was just from Dementia, someone that just, we had them, we had plenty of them at the company, just there was no capability to adapt, which is quite ironic, <laughs> really. Um, but <laughs> it, it was, it was they, they, these people can sound so authoritative and knowledgeable on the subject that they can make you feel a little bit like you're doing it wrong. Mm. Right. But that's just rubbish, quite frankly. <laughs> um, I, you talked about how to measure yourself. It's like, mm. that's, how, that's how to do it. At the end of the project, at the end of it, how is everyone feeling? Mm. If, if they're feeling good and it wasn't a disaster, <laughs> However you did it is fine, basically. <laughs> so what about estimating? Um, I think that's a, a big challenge for a lot of people. And um, I'm just curious, like, what pitfalls do you encounter when estimating either projects or even just kind of new pieces of work? Uh, for or, me, it's op optimism and pessimism. So, you know, um, not having enough detail. So optimism, pessimism is like, depending on who you're talking to. Um, I remember uh, working with developers and I would learn over time by tracking what, you know, estimates versus actual, that whatever they told me, it was gonna be three times that. And that was actually okay when you know it. <laughs> like, yeah. and I, the, diff the, the, the mistake that people make is not doing that calculation. Then they make the mistake of not telling the person what you're doing with their numbers, because <laughs> they kind of think that's not right. But if you explain to them, you show them the data. I think that can really help. But, um, I think, what else have I got here? Um, not knowing enough detail. The amount of times I've had to estimate and I haven't had yeah. enough detail and didn't have the confidence to ask for more detail. Um, that's, that's one of the biggest pitfalls, I think. And not having any idea of budget. Leaving a meeting or having to do something without any idea about budget because you think it's a, a sensitive subject. No. So I, right, I've, like I've, just come out and ask it. Yeah, well, yeah right. I mean, I've, I've worked on pitches for weeks, you know, long, hard hours, and, and we went in, and we, for, for example's sake, we said it was, oh, we're going to charge you 500K, and then they reply, oh, sorry, we've only got 10. You know, it's <laughs> like, it's, it, yeah, you've got to find out where you're going. If a, if a client won't tell you the detail or some idea of budget, I think that's a bit of an amber stroke red flag yes. in the first place, to be honest. It's a bit like yeah. going for a job, right? Like yeah. interviewing for a job. Yeah. Make sure that you're fit for it. Yeah. yeah. They're not going to tell you the salary, then <laughs> why bother? But it fits for experience. So in my early days, going for an interview, I would be like just grateful and I'd leave the room not knowing anything and have to make a decision. But now I'm like, I'm not moving until I know everything. Yeah. <laughs> I want every detail. Yeah. So what are the things that you do to kind of avoid some of those pitfalls? Do you have any tips for like better estimation? I think detail is mm. really where it's at. Like there's so many times that a client, so I work with um company owners and, and with them when they have a client coming in and they're trying to you know sell something to them. And there's just so many times where they just want the project so badly or it seems so cool or like a good, uh, you know, a good name or something that they don't 
they don't think about, the, you know, the owners don't think about that level of detail that you need. And, mm -hmm. and everyone kind of leaves a meeting feeling really good about this potential project. And then you go down to estimate and you're like, well, I know there's a website. <laughs> and I, I know basically nothing else, you know, I know what the old website looks like, but what's all the detail involved in that? And I think um, having the confidence and also understanding the repercussions of not getting that information, it's really important to be able to ask that and explain why it's important. And then also explain why, if they can't answer that, why that means maybe you shouldn't start the project yet. And maybe they should go back and really think about what it means to them and what they want out of it. Because there are certain things we can do to help them define that, you know, any client. Um, help them define success or what they need out of a project. And you know we're sort of the experts and owners in that area, but they need to have a certain amount of understanding of what they want out of it um, in order to give you detail and in order to work with you to get that detail. Mm -hmm. I have uh, two little tricks that I always use in scope conversations. Um, one is to ask every can we do it question with a time frame at the end of it. Like, can we do this in two months? Can we do this within three days? And it does require as a PM to like sit down and digest the scope a little on your own first and map like a rough timeline to show everyone. Because I think as humans, we're a little flawed. Like we don't really understand how long six months feel like, right? But mm -hmm. we, we have a much clearer sense of what a day, what we can do in a day and what we can do in a week. So that one, I feel like when we ask developers or clients, like, well, we can try to build you this site in two weeks, but can you give feedback within 24 hours because mm -hmm. we need to do yeah. X, Y, and Z and make sure they're as committed as us um, as well. My second thing is pointing to the exit during these early conversations. Like if there's, because you're never gonna get all the details you need up front, right? It's good definitely to ask as much up front, but there's always gonna be something that comes a little later that could blow out the scope. So just being honest with the client up front, like, hey, this part's still a little unclear. Yeah. We're happy to prototype for a week or two and then come back to the conversation. But just know that that conversation could affect our timeline and scope. And like, is there anything you want us to keep in mind while we do that? Like, you only have 5K to spend? Great, we have a working point. We can yeah. start from there. Uh, the only thing I found helped over the years was um, it takes quite a lot of effort. It, it requires detailed tracking. But once you have it in place, it did help me a lot. So. Uh, when I worked at one agency, we were, you know, there were projects going on all over the place, um, different project managers, different teams. It was, it was uh, Wild West in many ways. But the result of that, one of the results was that every estimate was, was wrong. Everything, everything always seemed to be under budget, uh, sorry, over budget. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so we, we went through an exercise where we essentially took the data we had from the existing timesheets from a couple, as far back as you can go, really. And we, we manipulated that into a, a spreadsheet where we broke it down by the, 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 the sort of phases that we worked in. So in that day, it was, it was more waterfall than agile. So you had design, uh, build, test, and project management. Um, and then going forward, when we were uh, putting projects together within our own system, we would try and structure it the same way. What we ended up with was essentially was a you know, year's worth of data but of every single project that took no account as to who was managing it, how many people, whatever it was. It just broke everything down by averages. So uh, it was all to do with the estimates and the actual. So the, obviously, the project needs to end. It takes some time. But what we found was that what when we looked at the bottom uh, row and we saw the averages, it gave us some form of baseline to what our agency, forgetting what we want to get to or what, what the client wanted, is what, what we have been historically spending on each project. Not only in hours, but also in percentage. And it just gave you, so if, now all these projects are different, different sizes, so it's entirely dependent on how you work. But what we end up with, we could start a very quick estimation process, knowing that project management usually, say the estimate was, or the average was 18 at the end of all this data. Um, we would know that if we went between 10 and 20, we're probably going to be somewhere okay. Now, it's not exact, but it, 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 we were starting from blank before, and now we were start. And, and of course, the more you do, the more you add to the sheet, the more refined your uh, metrics get. And it, it sounds a bit scientific, and it requires that initial setup and the discipline, but I, I find it worth it. I still use it today. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it well, seems to work quite there's well. There's also this idea of you know, working with a dedicated team. Um, you kind of become better at estimating together, yeah. right? Yeah. So. I've found um, in an agency setting, when you're constantly like having someone qualify leads and then bring in, you know, RFPs or I don't know what you call them here in the UK, but basically requests for proposals. Yeah. Um, when they come in and you're you're trying to figure out 
what that will cost. Like mm -hmm. as a group, um, like I worked at an agency where we had a group of five directors and after about four or five months when we had a solid team and we were meeting regularly, we would come to the, into the room all with a number in our mind mm -hmm. and then go through the exercise of estimating and see how close or far off we were until we finally got comfortable with saying like, let's just throw that number out there and see if it sticks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty exciting. Like that's, to me, that's more fun. Yeah. Um, it's also a little scary. Scares the life out right? of yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah. I think if, you, if you've got that history to kind of back yeah. that up and you have the data to say, like, this is why we're applying this number to this and this is what the scope looks like, then Absolutely. it works. One of the things it showed was that at the time it was quite a, a difficult environment I was working in. And I, I was being told to put 5% time for project management for a big project. Uh, now, I, I thought it was 5%. <laughs> That worked for the money, but obviously I felt that it was more. But I, I also thought it was probably about 30. And the spreadsheet showed we were both wrong. It was about 15, 20%. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it's good to be wrong as well, you know. Yeah. yeah. I've seen mostly between 15 and 20%. Yeah. Seems Yesterday in the, the workshop that I did, someone mentioned um, 30% was their standard, which I think is great because then it gives the PM more opportunity to be more deeply involved yeah. mm -hmm. in the project, which is important, I think. Yeah. Hello. There. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do you find that it's better to work with the project management time as a percentage of the budget as a whole rather than actually calculating the estimated time that the project manager needs to do in the project. Because that was one issue that I had um, mm. in a previous company that the project management time was a percentage of the whole, but then if it was a small budgeted project, it was absolutely impossible for the project management time to be within budget. So they just basically wrote it off and my hours never counted towards any of my projects. So I personally would, estimate time for PM based on tasks. So let's say if you're doing a discovery project and there are 30 stakeholder interviews, that's 30 hours. That's another 30 hours for the PM to sit in and take notes on all of those interviews, if that's something that you do as the PM. And then there's still the additional 20% of management time on top of that. So I think, again, I think it's really important for the PM to really be embedded in the project and really play an active role on the team and be um, an active contributor to the deliverables. Um, so, and then, you know, the, the bulk of their time is that percentage. Um, but uh, but I, to me, that, that works best. Mm. I don't know if you agree um, or disagree. But I think it's the whole fundamental, scrum fundamentalist, whatever you want to call it thing again. So there is the rule that there's 15 to 20%. That's the agency baseline, but you have to know when to flex and when to change and when that it just isn't applicable. So yes, you've got a small project that appears to be small in terms of revenue maybe, but it, who knows what goes on around that budget. You know, it doesn't mean that emails take less time. <laughs> you know, right. things take the same time. So if, you, if you, you have to know when to adapt and that's probably the skill. You, it's easy to put down a rule and follow it and then blame people when it doesn't work. But that it just isn't how life is unless you're repeating projects that are just boilerplate every time. So. I think too, like you have to know your role there are going to be clients who don't want to pay for project management time. And sometimes you have to know you have to back down because that client's not going to give. Or your company needs to say, bye-bye, we're not working together because you don't value this role that, that adds value to the team. Um, so it really kind of depends on the working relationship, too. Have you, any of you been in a situation where you feel like the client doesn't value or respect oh, yeah. your role oh, or opinion? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's hear the stories. Ooh, yeah. that's a bit, it's been recorded. Can <laughs> <laughs> we judge for this later? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell one yeah. if, if you're yeah. scared. No, well. All right, so I was on a project <laughs> that was a really large project um, and it came with a revolving door of new lead stakeholders, so lead client PM, mm -hmm. would be my point of contact. I was the, the lead PM. Um, so they kept dragging out the project. They would bring someone in new who would want to come in. Th that happened two times. The new person would come in, and they would want to change deliverables that had already been done. So for instance, we want to change a prototype or a wireframe because we don't agree with what we've already approved, someone else has approved, or their predecessor. I would then say, sorry, no, that's a change in scope. And then they would go around 
me and go to my boss or the owner of the company. At one point, they went to the owner of the company and said that I was not capable of doing my job and that I was terrible. I nearly, I, I actually flipped out on my boss. And <laughs> this was like two years into the project, which ended up being five years long because I stuck oh with it. Oh. Yeah. Um, and my boss came, you know, we had a good conversation and he thanked me for like, like I left that conversation thinking, okay, I'm going to be fired <laughs> because I kind of freaked out. And he thankfully valued the role and understood what I was up against and felt like I was doing my job and trying to stand our ground to not bleed money out of the agency. Mm -hmm. um, that turned into more in-person meetings with people who I knew hated me. And I just, I stuck through it because I felt like you have to be resilient and you just have to mm -hmm. be yourself. And that's kind of who I am. So yeah. that's my story. I'm a freelancer. So I work with clients who have clients. So like with agencies who hire me. And I've definitely worked with direct, like my clients, like agencies who don't value project management, which is wild because they're the ones hiring me and paying me money. Um, <laughs> Do so, it the way they want. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think there's this misconception too from some people that PMs are like the miracle workers. Like, oh, you have a PM. Yeah. Okay, the project's gonna be great. There's no issues. If something goes wrong, it's like the PM's fault, you know, even from within an organization, especially if they're maybe not well versed in what project managers do or are trying to hire a project manager as sort of like a, a band-aid to stick over, you know, issues that come from above or below or all sort of all around. So I've worked with a company um, who I recently stopped working with, but they hired me initially to sort of consult and tell them, you know, what, what processes needed to be changed. Um, and the answer was like, you don't have process, so you, you need to implement some. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, like actually getting estimates for work would be great instead of just like picking a number and hoping that it works because that's within the client's budget. Um, so things like that. And then we kind of got to like the operations level stuff where we had enough data to go through and, you know, figure out like how much are we actually spending on projects with internal costs? What does the overhead look like? Um, yeah. Are we going over, you know, what we've budgeted for project management time and are we getting any return on, you know, what we're putting in for anything extra? And the data was pretty clear that, <laughs> the, not to just toot my own horn, um, the project management time was very efficient and the rest of it was just so wildly blown out um, because we weren't properly kind of scoping things out once we had created a process and got to this point. Uh, and it's, it was sort of an internal struggle with um, my client, the agency, where they were just selling projects to sell projects and didn't realize that even if you do that and have a project manager, the project manager isn't going to just, you know, magically be like, yeah, it's like, it's not going to fix everything. You have to sell a, a project right from the start, especially if I'm not involved in that process where I, you know, I'm not able to say, oh, we definitely can't do that. And, you know, two months for 5K, it's actually going to be a year, and, you know, 200K. Um, that's a big difference, and, and I don't think they saw that. So I think it comes from within a lot, too, and, you know, definitely other clients who don't understand a project manager's role and don't want to pay for it, but I don't think agencies sometimes realize that, you know, you're not the, the cure-all, unfortunately, for projects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I, I like attending conferences like this, because yeah. I still feel like it's pretty new, like the yeah. project manager, confident, like finding your peers and actually meeting and like hearing like-minded stories that happen. Um, the reason why I say that is because those problems continue to persist because there's a lack of understanding of what our role is, right. yep. what our value actually, where it goes, um, yeah. and therefore putting a dollar sign and a worth to it. Um, and until we teach non-PM roles, especially like business owners, about how to appreciate that value, when to use and when not to, because not always do you need a project manager on a project. Um, we're gonna keep coming to that same issue again and again. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, right here. Yeah, it's on its way. Shout. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know if we'll hear you. <laughs> Hello. Um, so Betty, I was in your previous session downstairs oh. um, and you said that uh, you are more comfortable saying no to a client but find it harder to say no internally to your team. Mm -hmm. um, I was an account manager before and now I'm more in a hybrid account project management role. Mm -hmm. So I actually find it easier saying yes to the client because we want to promise and make them yeah. happy and kind of hold back the team a little bit, just saying, oh no, probably don't have time to do that and stuff like that. So how 
my question to you guys in your experience is um, what tips would you have how to say no to a client? Um, yeah, fundamentally, how do you do it? Not necessarily in terms of trying to do it in person or picking up the phone, just what do you say? <laughs> yeah. um, wow, okay. It, it really depends on the conversation and the kind of rapport you've kind of developed with the client, right? Some clients I can flat out and say like, are you kidding me, John? Like, you know already <laughs> that can't be done. Are you really gonna ask me to do this? Um, which is always nice to have a client like that. <laughs> and then there's others where you kind of have to just keep asking questions until they get to the answer, the same answer you already have in your mind on their own, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, well, walk me through why, why you need this and like yeah. what kind of issue would it solve? How do you think we would go about that? That's a really good idea. Always sounding like you're open-minded and just trying to learn more when I'm being evil here. In the back of my mind, this voice like, shut it down, shut it down, find the opening and shut the it down. The chimp. Yeah, the chimp, right? That's my chimp over there. <laughs> so it's, that's probably the kind of language you want to lean on. But the, the only way to really build that up is having those conversations smaller and more frequently from day one. Like, don't be shy about talking about money. Don't be shy about saying, we don't know about this and we need to investigate before we know it. And always putting it back in the context of we're doing it for your well-being. We want this product to launch for you. We want this website to work well for you. But the only way to do that is for them to understand that you need to know your stuff before you can go ahead and do it. So... Um, for you, I guess you can flip and think about it. Like, what are those things that make you feel comfortable saying no to your team? Is it because you know they understand where you're coming from already? Mm -hmm. And if that's the piece, then how do you get the client to build that same relationship with you? Right. Um, for, for me, it's, I, I'm not as smooth as everyone else. I suspect in this room, I'm more of a car salesman, is how I, <laughs> it's how I come across. Um, so I, I, I would tend to not try and smooth it out because I think that would not be me and it would come across even weirder, like a car salesman actually probably. <laughs> so I, I will just be blunt about it, but I will just try and, I will try and explain to either the team or the client why, why that decision is being made. Um, I think a lot of times people, I, I did myself early in my career, I would just say no and I would mm. experiment with how, how to say no and get burnt, maybe as you have as well. Uh, but as time went on, I just found that I would, depending on what mode I was in, so you're in account management mode and therefore I get the whole pleasing the client thing and so it's very easy to fall into that mode where you then walk over to the production team, ask them to do something which you even may, you may even agree is silly or whatever it might be and when they are negative about it, it's, when you're stressed, it's easy to relax on the stage but it's very easy when you're stressed and got loads of projects going to just, you just want people to just do it, right? Um, but I, I realised that wasn't helping and actually it was worth spending the time with either the team or the client just to explain the decision. It's worth that, even if it takes an hour, if you can get these smart people to just put themselves in your shoes for, for a second and realise why you're not making the decision for any, any other reason than that's just the way it is, you know, and if they can think of a better answer, fine, all ears, both sides. Uh, I, I tend to find that you're not, you, you've said no, but you've also just made them realise why. And they, when, you, when they haven't got an alternative, it, 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 the only alternative is to bang your you know, fist on the table and that, that isn't going to wash. So it tends to end like, oh, okay, fine. And it's just worth the time. I think it's really worth the time explaining to people. I also think, just to kind of add to that, you don't have to give an answer to someone right away, right? Yeah. You can, you can ask them the, the questions that you might ask that, so that you can understand what the request is. But you don't have to say yes or no right away if you're on a phone call or if you're in a meeting. You can say, you know what, let me talk to the team and get back to you. Mm -hmm. And then kind of formulate your response and think through what the options might be. Because if the answer is no, it could be no but, you know, we'll do something else. Or, you know, you might go back with an estimate for what it will actually cost so that it kind of, you, you feel more informed, you feel more confident. And they know that you're actually doing your best to kind of work on their behalf. Um, I feel for you because I've been in that position many times, but I do like the account management slash PM role because you're, you're able to be more active and sort of orchestrate conversations in a, in, a, in a better way and put your team in a better position, I think. I've done some consulting at a company where they had the, the dual role and one of the people doing the dual role said that they've realized recently they were they were literally being two people and they were trying to please the client and then actually screwing themselves over with the project. Yeah. And they, they wanted yeah. to talk to themselves, the accountant themselves, but they, 
I, I think it's, a, it's the one reason why, if you can do it, it's good to split those roles, but then you get other problems unless they work very well together, which you can solve, but pros and cons for everything, right? But yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think just being confident in that role and knowing that you're not out for your team or your client, like you're putting the project and the goals of the project first, like running every decision through those goals can really help you to kind of merge the good cup, bad cup scenario. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not easy. I actually, I prefer it. I think it's, it's, it's better to have one person speaking on behalf of everything, but personal opinion. You can kind of control the inflow and outflow of information a little more. Yeah. And I write, um, I write a newsletter, not to like personally plug, but literally the one I wrote yesterday was about like educating as a PM. And I feel like because we get to talk to clients, we get to talk to our teams, we get to talk to our managers, like we can kind of get that global context for things. Mm -hmm. And like, we have so much more information and knowledge that we can sort of educate with and, and let everyone know. Cause a lot of times like these requests or outrage you know from your team or whatever is just a lack of understanding of where anyone is coming from and that might be your fault it might not be anyone's fault um, but just sort of knowing where people come from I mean we're all humans we're all pretty much understanding of each other as long as we have that that perspective it, it really helps and like everyone was kind of saying you know getting to that why for the client and letting them know why you're making certain decisions and that you have their best interests in mind and you know this is how we work and these are the things we need to consider I think just really makes a big difference. And they get to learn a little bit in the process too. Mm -hmm. And sorry, one last thing, no, but like good. having, we have your best interests in mind, starting the conversation with that actual phrase. So it's mm -hmm. not just in your head and your intention, but letting them realize that that's the, that's the mood you're coming to the conversation with. Right. I think in terms of specific language, that's helped me. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, how are you selling your process or your agile process? So uh, for me, it, it's a way, it, it's a case of not selling it, if that makes sense. It's a way of guiding the client to, uh, to kind of understand that they need to run a project in a different way than before. So you can focus on previous examples. So, you know, how, how have your projects been with previous agencies or whatever it might be? If they've all been great, do you know what? Then maybe there isn't a need to change. Um, but often you'll find there are problems and those problems are associated with uh, parts of the waterfall-esque method and if you can just you, you rather than hard sell you just you take them on a bit of a journey and guide them towards the the, the the history that they have that they can relate to as to why another process might be beneficial um, and I think it's important to not to sell it as a silver bullet and not to sell it as it must be this way or it, 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 it's it, for me every time I've tried to sell it it's backfired every time I've just talk, talked it through and we've come to the conclusion of what's best for the client um, it, it seems to be a lot easier for me. I kind of like that you're using the client's baggage oh, yeah. to your <laughs> advantage there. It's, it's the like, evil side, right? Well, you don't know if you want to do Agile, but you know Waterfall didn't work so well last time. So the only way to yeah. change is to try something well, new. When we had some people come into my, uh, one of the companies I worked at, they were Agile consultants. Now, we were on board. We got them in, but the rest mm -hmm. of the company wasn't necessarily as on board. And that's fair enough. They didn't understand. It was, they weren't te technical. Hmm. Um, so the f one of the questions they asked, which was probably the most impactful question, was they just said, do you agree you need to change? That was it, and they left it. They, they didn't. Yeah. They, they left the silence, and they looked around the room, and you were looking at the you know, CEO, COO, and you know they do, but they knew what was coming, but they couldn't. They couldn't say anything but yes, you know. <laughs> and they didn't. That was already. They were already half sold then that they had to change, and it's quite a key thing. Um, give it a go. Yeah. I think you're better off just saying, "This is what we find that works. Yeah. We're the experts. We know what we need from you, and we know what we can deliver to you." whether that's you being a product owner and a part, you know, integrated member of our team, or whether we've got a process where you're reviewing and approving deliverables, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I like the idea of having a real framework for the way that your team works and the way that you really produce good work, um, but also knowing where you can adapt yeah. for a client, um, knowing that not everyone works, everything works for every client. Um, but if they're looking for the buzzword, tell them what the buzzword means for you. Yeah. So I think that's it. I see some people coming in um, and we have to wrap up, but thanks for joining us. This has been yeah. a fun conversation for me. Hopefully you guys uh, got something out of it. Um, so after this, um, if you want to go to tracks two or three, they're on the second floor. Um, I'm going to hang out here and we're going to do just a small kind of roundtable conversation about challenges. Yeah. Uh, thank you.
And if you guys have more questions. Oh, if you have more questions, feel free to come and say hi, especially at happy hour later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.